It is phenomenally good. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. For those of you who have already read it, I'm sure you could have guessed that I would love the book that I'm discussing today, which is A Heart So White by Javier Marias. And, oh man, it is phenomenally good. I mean, it's one of the top 10 for me, maybe one of the top five at this point in my life, really. I mean, it's better than Stoner, and that was, I mean, I consider that a perfect book. I can't remember who first told me about it, but many have over the years. It's a nice echo of my new digs here. It certainly doesn't hurt that on the cover there's a line reading, by far Spain's best writer today, by, drumroll please, none other than Roberto Bolaño, uh, one of my favorite authors. Javier Marias is a very famous Spanish author and translator who published his first novel at 19. Javier's father was a Spanish author and philosopher, Julia Marias, who was a student of Ortega y Gasset. At one point, his father was imprisoned for a little bit and then banned from teaching after opposing Franco. Marias wrote a story called The Life and Death of Marcelino Iturriaga, which was included in a collection of his stories called While the Women Are Sleeping, and he wrote that particular story when he was 14. Well, so this will be my last video as I'm going to just go kill myself. This is the first novel by Marias that I've read and I think it's superb. I mean, it's fucking marvelous. It's something to marvel at. Just in its elegance and sophistication and its style, it is really... He's just got it. Pedro Almodovar would have done a magnificent adaptation. I mean, string arrangements, you know, that whole tone of the skin I live in, it would be... A Heart So White, published in 1992, is about a man, his wife, his father, and his father's previous wives. It's an elegant, sophisticated Spanish philosophical mystery. A man is haunted by the actions of his father, so not his past necessarily, but his father's past. Javier Marias is a Spanish author and translator who was born in Madrid, but also spent a little bit of time over here in the States. Marias is an enviably astute writer. The title, A Heart So White, is referencing a line from Shakespeare's Macbeth, which I'm afraid I haven't yet read. I know. My hands are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. Uh, which was said by Lady Macbeth to Macbeth after he uh, has committed murder. His hands are red with blood. The main character of the novel is a translator like Marias. He knows more than anyone that you can't unhear something after it's said. You can't forget something after it's said. And sometimes it may be better if nothing was said. So how much should be really told? Should we tell the truth if it's just going to hurt somebody? How much does it actually help to know the truth? And since memory is fallible, what is the truth, really? The book opens with a family gathering. I think it's like lunch or something. And this woman gets up from the table, walks into the bathroom, takes out a gun, and shoots herself in the heart, committing suicide. The opening of the book is one of the most masterfully crafted introductions into a somber, expansive, gorgeous meditation on life, love, marriage, secrets, impermanence, death, and the inescapable consequences of past actions. The woman who killed herself is the second wife of the narrator's father, Rons, a man with a shadowy past, kind of a dandy, uh, works in the art world, works, uh, uh, worked at one time for uh, the Prado in Madrid. But yeah, he has a shadowy past, he's kind of sketchy, as we discover that she is actually the second of his wives to have died. His son, the narrator, the protagonist, grew up thinking that she was the only one, the first. It's that classic question, is it better to tell the truth or will that just do more harm? So for better or worse, semi-intentionally yet also sort of unintentionally, he embarks on a journey to learn more, to discover what really happened, along with his wife. I just don't want to tell you what happens, of course, you know, because it just builds up to it magnificently, you know, it just builds and builds and builds and, and then it hits and it's just, uh, you know, it, he, he seems to just have it like in his blood, this developed sense of narrative. You know, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like the past brilliant authors working through him or something, you know. I mean, he seems so well read. And also he has that quality of authors who are no longer around. He has that 
intelligence and maturity of authors from the past, old older authors. You know, it's like something that I never come across when. But I but I don't also I also don't read a lot of modern authors, so it's like you know, yeah, kind of guilty of that. But I don't know. He's got like this deep these deep roots, some some sort of. Or he's just a genius, maybe, is what it is. Marius frequently uses repetition to connect the thoughts, ideas, and situations in this man's life. It's like something happens and then there's this mental or philosophical kind of um, meandering or digre digression, you know, uh, sort of gets lost in thought and some anecdotes are brought up and, uh, and then we kind of come back to the narrative, but then we go off again. It's like taking cigarette breaks in the middle of the novel to kind of like drift in thought, but you're traveling along with them. You know, maybe that was probably actually occurring <laughs> while well, he wrote this. He smokes a lot. I think he, like, didn't go to a talk at Oxford because he, he would have to step outside to smoke or something like that. I mean, I, I think he spent some time at Oxford, so it's not, like, a huge deal, but it's sort of funny that he passed on it because he, he wanted to, you know, wanted to smoke when he wanted to smoke and where he wanted to. Um, I can respect that. Ambiguity is also a recurring theme. The idea that no matter the choices made, the result, eventually, is the same. Whether you do or don't do something, you know. The fear of missing out is sort of inconsequential on a long enough timeline. At the end of a life, or history, or time, everything is nullified. What happens becomes equivalent to what didn't. I know he's a fan of Thomas Bernhard, and you can, uh, you can tell after reading passages like this one, which I enjoyed a lot. Oh, Thomas Bernhard, I gotta read something else by him. He's funny and he's bleak humor. Sometimes I have the feeling that nothing that happens happens, because nothing happens without interruption. Nothing lasts or endures or is ceaselessly remembered, and even the most monotonous and routine of existences, by its apparent repetitiveness, gradually cancels itself out, negates itself, until nothing is anything and no one is anyone they were before, and the weak wheel of the world is pushed along by forgetful beings who hear and see and know what is not said, never happens, is unknowable and unverifiable. What takes place is identical to what doesn't take place. What we dismiss or allow to slip by us is identical to what we accept and seize. What we experience identical to what we never try. And yet we spend our lives in a process of choosing and rejecting and selecting and drawing a line to separate those, these identical things and make of our story a unique story that we can remember and that can be told. We pour all our intelligence and our feelings and our enthusiasm into the task of discriminating between things that will all be made equal if they haven't already been. And that's why we're so full of regrets and lost opportunities, of confirmations and reaffirmations and opportunities grasped, when the truth is that nothing is affirmed and everything is constantly in the process of being lost. Or perhaps, there never was anything. The word nihilism seems so cheap and dusty to describe the stance taken by Marius. Because for all the sadness and tragedy, and maybe cynicism and negativity or pessimism found within that passage, somehow, Marius never comes off as such, you know, as cynical or negative or, ni or nihilistic. Somehow, despite writing things such as that, he communicates the fascinating, mysterious, profound beauty of life. The possibilities, but also the guarantee of the inevitable collapse of everything. But it's more of a beautiful drift into an immense unknown that is suggested. That's much of what life seems like in his novels. This beautiful drift into an immense unknown. Memory is fallible, but fiction is definitive. That's what Marius describes in this interview with the Louisiana Channel, which I've linked to in the description box below. Check it out, he's great. He reminds me of, he has a little bit of the demeanor of uh, Jorge Luis Borges. But regarding fiction, you know, it's funny because you're, you're, uh, uh, you're saying something, you're writing something that didn't happen, but definitively. And that's the way it is, unquestionably, because you wrote it that way. That's how it was written. Whereas in real life, sure, you can say something happened a certain way, but are we really certain that's how it happened? No, because everybody can refute it. You know, everybody can challenge that. You know, that's not how it happened. <laughs> Maria says, one of the reasons we write and read novels, and fiction in general, is that it can't be denied by anyone. It's interesting because you have that kind of like foundation when you write fiction. You have this structure. Maria has never been married. 
Yet so much of the novel focuses on what happens when you're married, both positive and negative. His ideas on the subject are fascinating. I, I mean, really, for not having been married himself, he's very, you know, he's very observant. Uh, it's it, um, eerily so, you know. Marias has never married, but he often writes about the institution in his fiction, usually as a crucible for his favorite conflicting themes, our need to share confidences and the perils of saying too much. That was from The New Yorker. So much of the book is wrapped up in the idea of language and the translation of ideas that can't be ignored. Marias said, I've never been interested in what some people call naturalism or some people call realism. I don't worry very much about something that occasionally has been pointed out to me as a possible flaw. Many of the narrators and characters speak in a very similar way, even in dialogue. I'm not interested in using differentiated voices, not even in dialogue. It must be believable, but that's all. I think, on the contrary, that it, that it is a courtesy on the part of the author to give the reader something which is interesting, and if possible, intelligent. I can't bear, very much, the kind of dialogue you often find in many novels in which two non-intelligent people are saying non-intelligent things for pages on end. So, for an example of intelligent people saying intelligent things in A Heart So White, one of the greatest scenes in the book, the scene, the scene where I really realized I was reading a master, is uh, where the narrator mistranslates the words spoken by two politicians in front of the woman who is not yet his wife, doing so intentionally to see how she'll react. So this is the setup. You know, he's a high-profile translator, and so he's at this event with these two politicians speaking to one another. And I think they're based off of, I read it somewhere, I think, I'm not quite sure. I think they're based off of Margaret Thatcher and Felipe Gonzalez, but I'm not, I'm not certain. But um, this woman comes in to, uh, well, he's an interpreter, excuse me, he's, he's interpreting. So he's saying, he's translating the words and speaking them aloud as they're talking to one another so they can understand each other. And... Uh, this woman, this translator, comes in, his future wife, to uh, verify that what he's saying is accurate, to keep an eye on him, and you know, if he, if he messes up, she's supposed to say something, she's supposed to call him on it. Uh, that's her job. So she's sitting by him and he's doing his job, but he starts mistranslating the dialogue that these two politicians are having to make it more interesting. And he starts off kind of small at first, but then he like ramps up, and then he just like goes to town. Like he starts just like, putting these very interesting uh, philosophical ideas in their conversation. And uh, but, so they both think that they're actually having this, this really profound dialogue, you know, and uh, it's, it's terrific. It's sort of an act of, I mean, it's, he's kind of coming on to her, right? He, he is, because she doesn't stop him. It's an extremely romantic scene. It's also very funny. Uh, and, and, I mean, it's just so brilliant. I mean, it is a fucking brilliant scene. Suddenly, what would be dry small talk takes on profound significance as he orchestrates this intelligent conversation between these two politicians. Though it's his future wife's job to immediately correct him, she doesn't. And this risky, intimate action begins their relationship. Everything ties together, but it's not as if he had it all planned out in the beginning. On the contrary, you can feel the sense of discovery for the narrator, and, you know, for you, the reader, but it seems to have been that way for him as well when he was writing the novel. You know, he's writing to find out what happens. We're piecing the mystery together, along with the author, discovering the patterns and connections in the mystery of life. But just like the character, as well as us, I imagine the author is left with far more questions than answers. Because just as in life, nothing is resolved. It might be the call to prayer. So I moved to a Muslim neighborhood, Muslim and Polish neighborhood. So the bells you heard earlier are from a Catholic Polish cathedral, and uh, that would be the call to prayer. So I hear both. I love it. I love my neighborhood. Better Than Food. It's a hell of a book. So who should read it? Anyone who enjoys Borges, Bolaño, Juan Rulfo, Faulkner, and, uh, and finally Shakespeare who I have not read enough of. Pick this one up. It's astoundingly beautiful. It's one of my absolute favorite books of all time. Better than food, if there's, if, it, if there's anything. I mean, it's better than fucking everything. I mean, it, it is a magnificent book. I absolutely loved it. Now, who's gonna get this wonderful book along with some delicious coffee? It's time for the coffee lottery. 
And for those of you who are new to Coffee Lotteries, where I take the names of the patrons, all the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video, and I place them in this mason jar, and I pull out a name for each review that I do, and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book that I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And if you'd like to get in on that, you can head to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate, again, $5 or more per video. And uh, I sincerely appreciate it. You can also follow the link in the description box below that will get you in the coffee lottery. And uh, yeah, I, thank you. Thank you to all the patrons who have uh, kept this thing going. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Anyways, I'm also going to upload film reviews to this channel. Uh, I had a separate channel for it, but yeah. Whatever. I figured I'd just like consolidate because why not, you know, I figure everybody needs some good movies to watch. So the Criterion just uh, released their streaming thing since Filmstruck went down. And so uh, for, uh, for the winners of the coffee lottery for the film reviews, I'll just uh, give them a month of uh, streaming on the Criterion channel so they can watch a bunch of movies uh, or they can be sent a book, whichever one they prefer, whichever one you prefer. So yeah. That's the plan. All right, here we go. Who's gonna get it? Got it? Nope. 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 Tracy J. Tracy J. Thank you very much, Tracy J. Really appreciate it. Please hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, always remember, die reading. All right. Hope this made your day better. Take care and I'll talk to you soon. Have a good night. Ciao.